Welcome, everybody, uh, to the Sheridan College Science Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Bill Madison. I'm the Collections Manager for the museum. And I want to welcome all of you today. Um, I would also like to give a, a shout out thanks to Scott Newbold, who has been organizing these lectures for uh, a very long time now. And it's a, a thankless job, but we sure do appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, tonight, we ha are lucky enough uh, to have J.P. Uh, Cavagelli. Uh, he and I have probably known each other about 20 years now, at least. Um, what I did not know about J.P. is that originally he uh, is from back east and got his education at the University of Chicago in biology, which uh, led him directly to come out to Wyoming in 1983 looking for fossil mammals. Uh, he, there's a little bit of a hiatus there, but he came back in 1990 uh, to work for the University of Wyoming and uh, was, uh, was doing that for 14 years. Was collection, a collections manager there for a couple of years. Uh, got to do all sorts of interesting travels and, and collect all sorts of interesting specimens. Um, eventually ended up at, in 2004, at the Tate Museum in Casper, which I don't know how many people have been there, but uh, it's a great museum. Uh, I highly recommend it if you have a chance to get down there. A lot of really neat uh, paleontology uh, displays and specimens there, including uh, two that JP has helped over, you know, uh, has helped look over, including D the Mammoth, a Columbia mammoth, which is really neat, and Lee Rex, which is a tyrannosaur. Uh, so you guys should go check that out. But uh, JP is the current uh, collections manager, lab manager, and uh, organizes field expeditions for the Tate. Um, but you know he's he's been all over the world. He's, I know he's gone down to Africa, Tanzania, Mon Mongolia. In fact, I, one of my favorite memories is uh, JP on, I think it was a Discovery Discovery Channel or National Geographic special uh, with an inflatable sheep, which I'm not exactly sure what that was about, but I'm sure that's a story that's, that, that's worth telling. So anyway, please welcome JP Cavajal. Thank you all. And I will say that I think the first time I've been introduced Without cheat sheet, good job, good job, Bill. Um, so yeah, I am the uh, collections manager, collections manager, field trip organizer, and prep lab manager at the Tate Museum in Casper. We are also part of the community college. We are part of Casper College. Um, I've been there 19 years. It'll be 20 years in September. Um, if you want to talk about the Tate Museum, ask me about it later. I'm here to tell you about fossil birds of Wyoming. And now I'm going to try to figure out how to move the slide forward. Yeah, that might not work. <laughs> <laughs> I could do this. There you go. All right. Can you guys hear me in the back? Yeah. If I talk like, can you hear me if I talk like this? <laughs> okay, I'm going to talk a little louder. Here's the state of Wyoming. Wyoming is well known for fossils of all kinds, including dinosaurs and fishes and mammals and uh, assorted other stuff like crocodiles and turtles, reptiles in general. But what about fossil birds? Um, there are some classic fossil bird sites in the world. Liaoning province in China is a newly discovered in the past 20 years, which is full of early Cretaceous dinosaur birds. Really interesting stuff, but a topic of a different uh, speech talk. The Niobrara Chalk in Kansas is well known for Cretaceous marine birds and famously birds with teeth. These were discovered when uh, white man started trespassing all over the Western US, so what, 150 years ago? And they are still producing some cool fossils out there. Uh, a place called Messel in Germany. This is the size of the outcrop out there. It's not much, but it has produced more Eocene birds than any place in the whole wide world. And this place has amazing preservation. It's also got a huge collection of fossil mammals 
and it's got things like soft tissue preservation. That's a bad example. It doesn't have any. So a lot of the fossils out there come with hair, stomach contents. There's even insects that have uh, iridescent coloring. There's leaves that are still green, but that's a topic for a different term, different topic for a guy with a German accent. Oh, and the Green River Formation in Wyoming. We'll get to that. Another, it's a great spot for fossil birds and the La Brea tar pits in downtown LA. It's in there somewhere, right in amongst those tall buildings. And it was first discovered when Los Angeles looked like this. Think about that for a few minutes. Um, before we talk about fossil birds, we have to talk about what is a bird. And because we're talking about fossils, pretty much all we're gonna talk about, well, all we're gonna see is, is uh, bones. So let's look at a bird skeleton. This is your chicken dinner. Any vegetarians in the group? What, in Wyoming, there's not a single vegetarian. So you guys have all eaten a chicken. We've all done at least basic chicken anatomy. The parts you might not know of, this part, that part, the leg, the head. But there are some certain bones in a bird. The carpometacarpus is uh, this thing right here. It's the part on the chicken wing that you donate because there's no meat on it. This is the yummy part that has the big muscles. This is the part with the two bones. That's the part you throw away. The carpometacarpus is basically a couple of these bones fused together, typically has a wonderful pulley end on it, and two bones split like that. There's very few bones in the animal world that have that kind of uh, bone fusion. The coracoid is uh, this thing. Yeah, there it is, coracoid. This is a nice board. You can touch it and it doesn't wobble. <laughs> um, it's part of the shoulder girdle, and it typically looks like this. Very weird. If you eat a chicken, you can find one of those. That's your challenge next time you eat a roasted chicken. The charso metatarsis, you'll never find it on, in your dinner table unless you shop in Chinatown. Is there Chinatown in Sheridan? <laughs> we don't have one either. But it's a leg bone down here. Typically has three rounded pulleys at the bottom end, and that's where the three toes come from. Or I should say emanate out this direction. Very typical bird bones. So what I'm saying is that if you're in a fossil deposit and you find especially these three bones, they are easily recognized as birds. But are they easily recognized as a pigeon or a seagull or an emu? That's a much more difficult question. Um, here's a little bit of assorted modern tarso metatarsi. Take a look at different sizes, thickness. These are end views, ignore those. And the shape and uh, configuration of the three little pulleys at the end. You'll notice this one here is a songbird. Those three little pulleys almost flat in line. Very few of these others, they uh, mostly have some kind of curvature to them. That'll come in at the end. It'll all be on the test, which starts in about 45 minutes. Um, what about pterosaurs? And I was just asked this today by one of my volunteers who should know better, so we'll pick on her. Pterosaurs are Mesozoic. Raise your hand if that word, if that means anything to you. Mesozoic. All right, age of dinosaurs. These things are flying around. They also have very delicate bones like birds, and they are pretty rare as fossils, but their wings, instead of having that, uh, but that wing bone that you throw away in the chicken wing, they have a huge, uh, this would be equivalent of this bone in us, a couple of fingers here. And this bone here that you see here is the pinky. The wing is built very, very differently than birds. They are not birds. Bats are not birds either. Those are the three main groups of flying vertebrates. This is not a bird, this is a pterosaur. Uh, the earliest bird, earliest fossil bird, by earliest, I mean geologically early, um, goes back to the Jurassic found in Germany in the quarries for where they make lithographic limestone. Any print artists in the crew? Wow, no vegetarians, no printers. That's cool. <laughs> um, this thing has a very, uh, well, 
It's got feathers all over it. Beautiful wings. It's got feathers on a long bony tail. It's got teeth. You can't see them. It's got a long bony tail. It's got separate wing fingers. So that bone that you throw away in your chicken wings is not there. These are three separate wing fingers. It's got claws on the wings, which modern birds don't have. It's got unfused metatarsals. That means it does not have the tarso metatarsal. And that's the leg bone down here. So it's got three separate bones. Well, uh, three separate bones in the foot. And it's got no keel. The keel is the big bone that you get your white meat on and your chicken. Uh, it doesn't have one. The keel bone helps flight feathers in birds. This thing has a dinosaurian skeleton, but it's full of feathers. And this is also a talk for a different night when some guy has a German accent as well. And for those of you who aren't geologists, raise your hand if you're not a geologist or have very little geological training. Good. Then this is geology 101. I'm getting hot already. <laughs> um, we're looking at the geological time scale here, going from youngest to oldest. Um, at the bottom, we have Jurassic, which is the same age as that oldest bird. So for the older Triassic, I put who cares because there's no bird fossils in it. <laughs> and we don't expect to find any. <laughs> um, we're going to be looking at this and working our way up the scale in Wyoming. That's the plan here. We're going to skip the cave deposits because those things are so recent that the birds are very similar to what you see today. And I just didn't have time to learn them all. So let's start at the bottom. The Jurassic, the Morrison Formation, known for dinosaurs, found all over the state, has birds. Or does it? This is the only bird known from Wyoming, from the Morrison Formation. We're looking at the back of the skull. This little round thing is the place where the neck, well, the first <laughs> neck bone connects to the back of the skull. Here we're looking into the brain case. It's crushed. It's a piece of crap. It's about this big. Uh, let me see. There's no scale bar, so I can make stuff up. It's about that big. It was found down in Quarry 9, which is up uh, down by Medicine Bow. Mr. Marsh, if you know anything about Copen Marsh, that's him. In 1881, identified it as a bird skull. It's the same age as Archaeopteryx. In 1986, John Ostrom said, no, this is not a bird. It's a pterosaur. So Wyoming does not have any Jurassic birds. Cretaceous. We're going to start with the Mesa Verde Formation. So for those who aren't geologists, the formation is a pile of rocks that, has, that is easily distinguishable, let's just say. Um, <clears throat> the Mesa Verde Formation is about 75 million years old. It's also found all over the state. Um, there are potential... Cretaceous birds from that age, including these two, which are well known from Kansas. Here's Kansas, New Mexico, Texas, uh, Alabama, Manitoba, South Dakota. What about Wyoming? Well, not yet, but the beds in South Dakota are just across the border, and they are the same beds that are in just north of Lusk. If people keep looking, they will find an Ichthyornis or a Hesperornis outside of Lusk. Hasn't been done yet, but this one is the only Mesa Verde Formation fossil bird from Wyoming, and it's a vertebra. Um, not much to say about it. The guy who identified it identified it as Hesperornis. I think that's a little bit wishful thinking to be able to identify it to be the same as this guy here when we only have one vertebra, but I'm not going to I'm not going to criticize him for that. Uh, this was found west of Casper about 30 years ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Lance Formation is the pile of rocks at the end of the age of dinosaurs, Bignosaur, uh, T. rex, Triceratops, and other late Cretaceous dinosaurs. This is what it looks like north of Lusk. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's known for big dinosaurs. That's our T-Rex at the State Museum. Notice no head, but that's a different story. These things are what we call microfossils. 
The biggest one there is about an inch and a half long. They are all fairly small, and we find them in piles, accumulations of small fossils. The uh, fellow who started doing this in the last formation was from Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley in California in the 60s. He screen washed, which means you take a sample of this soft sandstone and you put it in a box of, with screen on the bottom, put it in some water, let it soak, it melts the rock, and it comes out with a handful of fossils. He screen washed, I think it was 40 tons of this stuff. And he was looking for fossil mammals. He found tons of fossil mammals. Here's a fossil mammal down here. That's a little jaw. And he found a handful of bird bones. And they were all isolated things. And I'm not going to go into the details of them, but this is what he found. Oh, raise your hand if you're familiar with bird taxonomy. I got one. I got two. <laughs> I got three I saw. When it has this ending on it, that means it's a certain order of birds. An order being a group of Similar birds, galliform, code word for chickens, anseriform, code word for ducks, charadriform, code word for gulls and shorebirds, prosoleriforms. Help me, guys. Uh, yeah, big marine things. Pelicaniforms are, pel oh, this is a uh, frigate bird, I think. Pelicaniforms are pelicans, cetacaforms are uh, parrots. And five that don't fit anywhere, and some enantiornithines, which is a group of birds that are from that Chinese spot that I told you earlier. There's a bunch of them known there. They only live in the Cretaceous. They, are, they went extinct with their dinosaur cousins. <clears throat> I honestly don't know very much about them, except that there are more dinosaurian in bones than our modern birds. So the birds from the Lance Formation are isolated bones sampled uh, by getting a ton of other stuff. On the Zerbst Ranch, north of Lusk, there's a big trackway of dinosaurs. The actual trackway goes from there to about here. And it's still in, in situ over there. There are large bird footprints crossing paths with duck-billed dinosaurs. And that's all we know about these birds, is their footprints. So not much in the lands. We are now skipping up past the dinosaur extinction into the Paleocene, uh, the Fort Union Formation. Uh, I went too fast. There it is. That's the Fort Union Formation bird fossil. There's a set of dinosaurs. I should do that too. I think it's all. <laughs> it's a set of bird footprints with slightly webbed toes. And this was found up by Cody. It's the only, only specimen that came from that site. It, it was found as a fallen block in a pile of talus. And I'm sure that the guy who found it spent time looking for where it came from. But that is oftentimes really difficult to find. And I'm going to tell you a bit. When I started, I was working in the Hanna Formation here, which is Paleocene in age from about, from near the town of Hanna. Imagine that. Um, we collected lots and lots and lots of rock to screen wash, collected probably several hundred mammal teeth and jaws, that's what we were looking for, and one bone that I could tell was a bird. So the point of this is that bird fossils are pretty rare. We're going to move up into the Willwood Formation, which kind of spans the, oh, hey, help, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Do it over here. So the Willwood Formation is the red and white stripy stuff you see outside of Cody. It spans the Paleocene and the Eocene. It's well known for fossil mammals. In the, uh, it's also known for this thing. This is Diatrima, also known as Gastornis. It's pretty famous. You'll find models of this thing in the kids' dinosaur uh, toys packets. It stands about, well, that's Russell, my colleague. He stands about six feet tall. So does he, or six or seven or eight feet tall. It's a big, big bird uh, who's been debated for a long time whether this thing is a carnivore or a plantivore. And the latest theory is that it eats plants. And that was based on a study done by, oh, this guy here, Andors, who uh, looked at the 
the, the, the physics of the way the skull would work. Did it have the strength to tear animals apart? And he thinks it does. Uh, yeah, he thinks it does. Another guy named Ken Rose, who's at uh, Johns Hopkins, thinks it doesn't. So the question's still out there. It's supposedly related to a screamer. Raise your hand if you've been to South America and seen a screamer. Uh, I didn't, me neither. I, I shouldn't raise my hand. <laughs> a screamer is a very primitive sort of duck. That's it there. Lives like a duck, looks like a duck, but it doesn't have the flat beak of a duck. Um, what's the other thing? Oh, here is Russell is our educator and artist. This is Russell's drawing of a diatrima, also called Gastornis, looking at the Eocene horse. And notice the blank look in his eye. <laughs> is he looking for food or is he just passing by? I think the jury's still out. And then in the, I want to say 1990s, this fellow Peter Hood, who is at the University of New Mexico, started finding these nodules in the Willwood Formation, so outside, right outside of Cody, actually, almost, almost within the city limits. And they had lots of mammal bones in it. But the bonus thing was that he found bird bones, including these, here's one of those uh, sort of coracoid bone. There's a tarsometatarsus. And so with a handful of bones, he was able to identify this as a primitive heron. This was restudied and more bones were taken out of the rock. They take the rock and they dump it in uh, the hydrochloric, actually not hydrochloric, but a uh, formic acid. And they let the limestone dissolve and end up with some really nice bones. But uh, it is now known to be a parrot relative. And this is your essay question down here, homework assignment. How do you go from a heron to a parrot? How does the heck does that happen? The herons and parrots are very different birds. And one of the ways that happens is you find more bones in the limestone nodule. Uh, the rest of it is it's very technical. Yes, sir. Are, are these limestone nodules akin to a strigiform pellet? No, they're no, they're they're like that big. So they're wow. huge. And one of the I've, I've read a bunch of papers on them. They don't know what what causes them and why they're full of of and they have, they've got some amazing articulated mammal skeletons out of this stuff. From the Paleocene, remember the stuff I told you about where we washed countless tons in Laramie and we got hundreds of teeth and jaws. These guys are getting articulated skeletons. It's a really weird, weird, weird uh, geological setup, Un not understood. So here's kind of what I just told you about. This is one of those nodules. You see bones in there. They've made a fiberglass jacket for it and they dump acid all over it and the bones etch out. Here's a skull. Here's a wing of a, uh, a forest raked, which is a large South American thing that looks like that Gastornis, um, but is not related. And this stuff was started getting done in the 90s, I think. And only in the past few years has uh, Professor Hood um, done more work on him with his students. He took some time off to do modern bird DNA stuff, if I remember correctly. But this is one of the cool things he found. A lithornithid. This will be on the test. The, the, uh, the derivation, litho, rock, ornithid, bird. It's a rock bird. Uh, there's a song in there somewhere. I'm going to challenge one of you guys to sing it. I'm not going to. It was found to be a relative of kiwis and tinamous, which are, which we call ratites. Ratites include ostrich, rhea, uh, emu, kiwi, cassowary, and tinamou. And they are mostly large flightless birds or small flightless birds or small poorly flightless birds. Their skull is built very different than all the other birds. And they have a beautiful skull that tells them it was in this group of paleognathus birds, which means ratites in English. There's the bones that they found, several, uh, I mean, a really nice skeleton. Sorry. One of the, yes, sir. I was going to ask um, the Zerps formation with the uh, fossil imprint. Yeah. I noticed that that just had three toes forward, like the rat tights. Do you think that that one was lithornid for the footprint on the Zerps? Um, probably not, because we're in the Eocene now. There has been no lithornithids found that far back. Oh, okay. okay. And one of the keys to 
dinosaur footprints as compared to birds, birds have a backwards facing thumb. Dinosaurs don't. Right. And those things were big. These things are not quite as big yeah. so far. I mean, who knows what made those footprints at that point? Uh, one of the cool things about it, this is the beak. It has all these little holes on the end, which are for nerves and muscles and stuff. And he's arguing that like the modern snipe and the kiwi, this thing could probe into the mud and open the tip of its beak under, under sub muddy. There's a word for that, isn't there? In the mud and pick out little yummy things. Uh, there's been five different species of lithoanithids. So this is going back this far. This is a pretty common kind of bird. If you were living out there in the, in the Eocene, you would know what a lithoanithid looks like, but we're not there. Um, here's that one I showed you earlier, a paracathartes. It's also a lithoanithid. It's a big bird, probably stood about this tall. So maybe the footprints were as big as the ones we saw there. Um, this is, I'm not in it, well, I am, Anacarnornis. Anacarnornis, also a screamer. Look, there he is, a screamer. Nice skull from this guy. Oh, that's a screamer skull, sorry. That's the nice skull from the fossil. Quite a bit of the skeleton is known, which is typical for these nodules. This is atypical for the nodule. This is, they are claiming to have a vulture based on that fragment of the beak. I don't know if that's viable, but I'll go with it. They have found a hoopoe-like bird, so I'm doing, this is the modern equivalent down here. Bits and pieces of something that can say is a hoopoe. Bits and pieces of something is a bee eater. There's the bee eater with coins for scale. And something related to mouse birds. Raise your hand if you know what a mouse bird is. Because we don't live in Africa, we don't know. <laughs> mouse birds are birds about this big. They live in Africa. One of their uh, distinguishing characteristics, excuse me, this is not my hand, this is my foot as a mouse bird. I can take this toe and move it backwards. It is pamprodactyl. That's on the test, pamprodactyl. It can take the third toe and move it backwards at will. And we know that because the modern mouse birds can do that. And that is reflected. I don't have a tarsometatarsis, but it's reflected in those three pulley joints at the bottom, at the top of the foot. Um, here's a owl. Owls also have very distinctive tarsometatarsis. This one is the fossil. This is compared to a great horned owl and a uh, barn owl. And if you want to do this, do the obs observation, they look rather similar. This is as much as the fossil as they got. So I have a little question here. Is it nocturnal? We don't know because we don't have a skull. To know if an owl this old is nocturnal, you have to have those big, huge forward facing eyes. So the willward formation. There's the bird watchers list with a couple of examples, uh, half a dozen plus different kinds of birds. Um, one of the things you'll notice, those that are close to things we know, screamers, South American, coracoforms are kingfishers. In this country, we have one species of kingfisher. If you go to South Africa, there are kingfishers galore, I'm gonna say Africa, Asia, um, Australia, there are kingfishers galore, there are hoopos that I showed, there are bee eaters, all related to kingfishers, all living in tropics on the other side of the world. This, you'll see this is a recurring theme. Um, what else is up there? Um, a few Eocene birds. We're going to move up the hill here to the Wasatch Formation. Uh, where am I? Sheridan. I did not pass any Wasatch Formation. If you go Western Casper, all the way between Casper to, uh, what's the town out there, Shoshone, it's almost all Wasatch formation, especially once you get past Hell's Half Acre. Eocene, early Eocene. This is the collection of Wasatch formation birds. Okay. Two isolated uh, bottom of the humerus that were found while people were looking for fossil mammals. Imagine that. And this is, the other ones are stuff from my collection. This is a piece of dinosaur, uh, bird egg. These are two separate tarsometatarsuses. Um, don't know what they're from. 
and I'd have a hard time telling you because both of them are missing the third pulley. They only have two, and you really have to have all three to even be able to make a guess as to what that comes from. Uh, one cool site in Sweetwater County, Tom Stidham is a paleontologist who specializes in fossil birds. <clears throat> they found a site called Turtle Graveyard. I guess it has a lot of turtles, and it has, well, turtles, crocodiles, fish, and mammals, and all these birds, which are explained right there. So presbyornids, a duck, shorebird, uh, crane relatives, another crane relative, another crane relative, a shorebird, and woodpecker, toucan relatives, and then kingfisher relatives again. We saw them earlier. Green uh, River Formation is about the same age. It's the stuff between, well, I lied. Yeah, this is the same stuff. Same age, there are more bird eggshells that I found out there and the tarsometatarsus of an owl. This is all there is of that fossil. So again, not much found by people looking for mammal teeth. Now we get to the Green River Formation. How much time you guys got? <laughs> <laughs> the Green River Formation is some famous fossil deposits in Southwest Wyoming and going into Utah, Colorado. Eocene in age, uh, well known for being platy deposits in certain places just full of fossils. In Lincoln County, outside of Kenmer, they mine these things commercially. There are probably 20 different commercial fish quarries out there. And they spend, well, they're at 7,000 plus feet. So they spend the short summer digging up fossil fishes. And when they dig up a thousand fish, kind of like the mammal guys, finding a thousand teeth, they find birds. So the Green River Formation known for fishes, including stingrays, turtles, uh, plants, um, insects, crocodiles, frogs, shrimps, and bats. <laughs> Here is the first known bird fossil. This was found in the early 1900s, I think. It's just a couple isolated feathers. We'll never know what they were from. Um, these are, like I said, platy deposits. You don't find the fossils beautifully exposed. This is what you find and after you prepare it in the lab, you end up with something like this. So just so you don't get lost, this bone here is that bone there. This bone here is right up in here. That one there is that thing. This whole block is up here. This piece slides back into that little groove, giving us the feathers. Um, the fish, I don't know if it's actually, I, I guess it was is not in that picture. But this is probably, I don't know, 100 hours of prep work to get these things to look like that. So it's a lot of work to get these things, but they are out there. Um, how did that happen? This was the first fossil bird <laughs> found out in Kemmerer area. And Gallinuloides is a relative of the Gallinule. Or is it? It's been later studied to be a relative of the Curacao. Again, South American, tropical, primitive crane-like animal. <clears throat> Here's another specimen. This one is in the Wyoming Dinosaur Center. Uh, another species, I'm not gonna even tell you all the names of these things, because there's a lot of them. This is the type specimen, this is what it's named after, a skull. There's a much better specimen over here. These things are, there's that word again, lithornithids. They have that same skull structure we saw in the limestone specimen. Here's another lithornithid. That's the same one I showed you with, to show you how to prep these things. So again, lithornithids were pretty species rich and there's quite a few specimens of these. When I say quite a few, that means more than three, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, uh, a frigate bird. Frigate birds are known modern days. Raise your hand if you know what a frigate bird is. If you don't, they look like this. They're big birds. They live in uh, tropical oceans and they are typically known to be uh, not scavengers, but robbers. They steal fish from terns and gulls. And, and this thing is, this thing has a six foot wingspan. If you've ever been down in tropical oceans, there's a chance you might've seen them. They don't always fly around. This is a mating uh, display. They don't always fly around like that. Um, 
They are saltwater birds. This is a freshwater deposit. Things are flexible, like that stingray I showed you earlier. And this is my favorite quote on the whole of fossil bird studies by Stuart Olson, who wrote the paper on that last on this fossil. If Limnofrigata had been found with ice, as isolated bones, it would have been identified as many different types of birds. Which makes you wonder about all those isolated tibiotarsuses that you find in this and the lance formation bones. So in reality, we want to find better specimens. But that's uh, eventually in the Green River Formation, you can. When that thing was first published, it was one specimen in the early 70s. There are now at least this many and a second species with also this many specimens. So there's a lot more, again, less than 10, a lot more specimens of Limnofrigata. Vadaravis is a heron type thing, possibly an ibis. Sheila. Um, is that a radiograph? Uh, yes, this is an x-ray of the same specimen. I'm not sure what the THV that's shining like that is. Oh, thoracic vertebrae. And why are they shining like that? I don't know, but there's more vertebrae shiny over here might probably have some iron deposits right there. But yeah, they oftentimes they can x-ray these things to see what they're looking for before they go and prep it. Yes? Are fossil birds found anywhere um, that are not articulated in a matrix? Yeah, all the first ones I showed you, before we got to the Green Formation, Green River Formation, they're not articulated, they're all random. So I mean, can they be articulated in a soft oh, environment? I have one example I'll show you at the end. <laughs> um, the, the skeletons of diatrima, the big giant thing, have been found not so much articulated, but associated. So you have a pile of bird bones that are huge, all in a small area. That's a pretty good guess. You have one skeleton. But in general, not so much. So this thing, Mesolornis, is a rail, there's a rail down there. And they are also found in the German site in Messel, hence the name. Here's a couple more Messelornis skeletons. So there's again, quite a few. Uh, Messelornis is the most common bird in the German deposits. I think in Messel, half of the bird specimens are Messelornis. And when I say that, I said earlier that Messel is the best bird fossil site in the world. It is the best Eocene fossil site. It's also the best fossil bird site in the world. They have probably 10 times as many fossil birds. That one little pit I showed you earlier, it's pretty rich in birds. The Green River Formation is rich in birds, but that's all relative. There are numerous things that have yet to be described. Here's a couple of uh, supposed uh, crane relatives. Then there are families that we don't know what they really belong to. This is Primobuco. When it was first published, this was the specimen. When I first saw this, I thought this was really cool. This fossil was preserved running away. <laughs> but if you look at it closely, that's the back leg, that's the wing. So he's crawling away full speed. And then since, uh, since this was published in the, I think, 90s, a bunch more specimens have been found. Um, Tinskia, named after one of the quarry operators out there, is a early parrot. And you can see the big fat hooked beak that parrots have there. Um, this is also a parrot, but where's his head? Again, they're identifying it by a very short tarsometatarsus and the feet on parrots. How many of you guys have pet parrot? All the vegetarians. <laughs> parrots are one of the few groups of birds where the Toes go two forward and two backwards, which you can see in this thing. And the very short torso metatorsis is typical of parrots and penguins, and maybe some of the birds. Uh, here's another parrot relative. There's that short torso metatorsis, big, almost hooked beat. But this one is supposedly somewhere between parrots and songbirds. Uh, this one is also a uh, parrot relative. I think, I can't remember, I, I cheated. I didn't, I didn't put my cheat notes on there. Anyway, another beautiful skeleton. The one thing I wanna show you on this one, this is the same specimen. This one has been coated with aluminum chloride and they do that, they put a thin layer of white stuff on the fossil so that these darn feathers will disappear 
and anything else like that's a stain I believe up there on the rock. Easy to mistake that in a black and white photo. Over here, they've coated it with white powder, very thin, mm -hmm. and then you just blow it off later. But the bones stick out much better. It's an old paleo trick. Trepica is an oil bird. Again, South American, tropical. It eats fruits. Uh, and this is kind of cool. This is a modern oil bird lower jaw, and that's the fossil right there. Very similar in shape. And a fluvoviri david. Uh, yeah, that one. Oh, this is cool. Latin name, fluvio, river, viri, green, avis, bird, green, river, bird. <laughs> and it is, oh, it is a, a potu. This is a modern potu. There are fossil ones over here in Wyoming, in Messel, maybe one in France, and a bunch in Australasia. The shaded region is where they actually live nowadays. Again, a continuing theme, a tropical bird in the tropics of Eocene, Wyoming. This one related to uh, the woodpeckers and kingfishers, but related to puffbirds and jacamars. Raise your hand again if you know what they are. Tropical South America uh, relatives of the kingfisher. Another stem coracoform, kill, uh, kingfisher relative. And I'm going to, uh, this chart on the right is a, what we call a cladogram. This is a modern taxonomic system where paleontologists and modern biologists will basically take a group of animals and care, uh, code them for all the characters, like you take that tarso metatarsus and you say, is it long, is it short, is it medium? If it's long, if it's long, it gets one number. If it's short, it gets another number. If it's medium, it gets a third number. And you do, are those three pulleys in a line? Are they this way? Is this one bigger? Is that one smaller? They take hundreds of characteristics from the fossils they have. They throw it all into a computer and they come out with who's related to who. Um, this has been done for 20 years in paleontology. It took a little while for this, to, this system to uh, be accepted. And one of the reasons, because they some of the first people to do it were the modern bird studiers, modern ornithologists. And they came out with things like, uh, if I can remember, falcons and uh, falcons are more related to parrots uh, vultures, turkey vultures you see flying around here. Also, modern, uh, relatively, well, in my youth, they were always classified as, as birds of prey. They are now more, by this system, they are closer to storks. So it took a little while for that kind of stuff. It was pretty revolutionary, but it is the way they do these things. So when I say this is an early parrot, that means it's related to parrots. Where's the parrots on here? They're not but they would be down here somewhere in the parent tree, if you will. <clears throat> um, Annie Avis, this one's fun. I like to pick on Peter Hood because he named this not once, but twice after his wife. It's a beautiful bird, beautiful body, no head. <laughs> Is that an insult or compliment to his wife? I don't know. <laughs> and I'm sure that if he heard me say that, he would probably shoot me. <laughs> this is a uh, aluminum chloride version of the same thing. And this thing is also a mouse bird. Remember them? African group. Uh, there, mouse bird with the, with the toe here that they can at will move back and forth to the front or the back. African, here's another mouse bird relative. And this guy, Fluoro. <coughs> People ask what these things are. These little circles are the tracheal rings. They were fossilized in this specimen. And this thing is related to turacos, tropical African. You get the picture? Uh, here we have something that's not tropical and not African. It's a hummingbird swift relative. Hummingbirds and swifts have for a long time been known to be very similar. 
Do you know what a Swift is? Everyone knows what a hummingbird. Swifts are little birds that fly around and like this very stiff wings and they fly around the sky and they eat insects. Very different from hummingbirds, but they've been grouped together because they both have very, very, very small feet. That's the classic definition. But even with the cladistic system, hummingbirds and swifts did come out as one group. So that was cool. And these things, this little guy is supposedly a, a simple version of one of them. There's a swift, there's a picture of the modern swift, there's a fossil swift. Ah, a zygodactyl day, a family of primitive, maybe passeriforms of songbirds, but a relative, let's say, not quite a songbird. And this is a similar thing. This one's kind of funny. It's in the Wyoming Dinosaur Center. That part, the cool part, is painted on. <laughs> <laughs> Here's another songbird relative and a kingfisher yet to be studied. And then there's Presbyornis. This is a, well, that's a life reconstruction of it. It was originally described as a flamingo and then they found the skull. The skull turns out to be very duck-like. And then they did a, these are all pictures of specimens in Laramie. They have a lot. This thing was found in nesting colonies out in Southwestern Wyoming where they found, uh, a lot of presbyornis bones and lots of eggshell. These, this is a whole box of coracoids. There's one with that funny, almost T-shape. So there's, uh, this is, these things are known to nest in colonies, probably on the shores of Lake, of uh, the Green River Lakes. These are found, you asked the question. These are found not in the flat rocks, but on the edge and in large colonies. So lots of the same bone in but disarticulated and you can see that here on the bottom but not articulated but there's bone rich layer there's the skull down on the bottom there's another skull right up here very wide flat beak and they are now by because people studied it, it cladistically they are more related to shorebirds so not a flying out not a duck shorebird there's some footprints of the thing Probably, again, footprints, it's hard to say what exactly they came from, but you can tell as compared to the one we saw earlier, this thing has fully webbed toes. So the webbing goes right to the tip. So definitely some kind of mud walker. <clears throat> this is the one that you were at, that I mentioned. This is an articulated wing. That's the wishbone, the humerus, radius ulna, and that carpometacarpus that you throw away on your, uh, your chicken wing. This is a stereo picture. If you guys like to cross your eyes and see this in three dimension, I challenge you, I'll leave it up for five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Did anyone see it jump out? One. <laughs> okay, here's a, a bird watcher's view of Eocene fossil Green River formation. I'm not gonna put these on the test, but notice it's quite an impressive list. And except for a few specimens, a uh, few species, I should say, most of them are known for one or two specimens. That's part of the take home message. Except for Presbyornis, of course, lots and lots of that. And some of the, uh, uh, anyway, I can't remember which ones, but I showed you that. Uh, moving up in the formation, the Bridger Formation, if you all, you all ever make it to the southwest corner of the state, are the blue gray outcrops around Little America, later Eocene. In the mammal world, in the Eocene, the mammals you find out there are primitive. They would not be recognized by modern mammalogists or by mammal, modern citizens. Once you get up into the Oligocene, you start seeing things that look familiar. In the bird world, kind of the same thing. The bridge of formation doesn't have much. This is a thing that, whose name I'm not gonna try to uh, tell you about. It's close to the rails. Uh, two more mouse birds, there they are. Again, those mouse birds and the lithoanithids, probably pretty common animals back then. And an owl. This is a Bridger formation owl. That's it, torso metatarsus. But this is the other one we saw from the earlier Eocene. I turned it around so you can see that a very similar structure. This is looking head on into where the toes join. Very similar structure there, making these two probably very close relatives. And then there's one really, really nice specimen of a undescribed yet hawk. This is a skull, that's the foot. The thing is almost all there. 
It's this one was found in soft, softer sediments, pretty much articulated. Uh, and then there's a couple of random things that are also found. This one's from Messel. Don't believe that that's Wyoming, but there are other specimens known from isolated bones. Um, and then there's eggshells. Here's a list of birds from the Bridger Formation and Washakie is the same age. Uh, a random selection. And then there's this Omomis quarry. This is a really cool site in, I think, Uinta County, somewhere between Sweetwater and Uinta, right south of uh, I 80. It's got a flamingo, it's got two hawks, it's got two rails, it's got a uh, crane relative, a shorebird, eggshells. And this Omomis is an extremely rare primate in the Bridger Formation. There is one skull known. It has big forward facing eyes, um, telling us that it's probably nocturnal. And the cool thing about this in this Omomis quarry is that there are lots and lots of Omomis, including some skulls that are broken. Uh, so they think it's a owl pellet deposit. So there's no owl fossil there, but there's an implied owl. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> and this owl is eating nocturnal monkey things, and also some birds. Uh, moving up into the Oligocene, this is the White River Formation that you'll see uh, north of Lusk and just east of Douglas on the interstate. Um, known for fossil mammals. This is a bird foot, partial foot. We have the Tate Museum. There's that tarso metatarsus again with one, two, three pulleys. I haven't identified this or even tried to, but there it is. And that's what the Parsometatarsis looks like after we took it out of the rock. Um, there are a few birds known from the area of Torrington uh, related to the Seriema, which is one of those primitive crane relatives. Um, and this is a pretty cool specimen. This is what a toady looks like, modern bird. Again, Cuba tropical relative of kingfishers. This is the modern skull. That's the fossil skull. This one was found with quite a few of its bones. So it's a fairly, fairly reliable identification, but it's also in the same nodule had four small owl skeletons. This one's at the Smithsonian. The guy who was working on it retired before he got a chance to finish it. And no one over there wants to work on it. Or that's the story I'm told. I can't wait till they describe those owls because I think that'll be cool. Um, the most common fossil bird, probably in Wyoming, it, definitely in the White River Formation are fossilized eggs. And that's three examples. One of the things we have with fossilized eggs, they often comes crushed with cracks. They are, the egg is indeed same thickness as a chicken egg generally. And it has a very distinctive texture. If you look at a chicken egg, they have a very distinctive texture. We get a lot of people bring us museum specimens. Well, in the museum, we get people bringing us, hey, I found a dinosaur egg. I say, that's not a dinosaur egg, that's a calculator. <laughs> Usually I say, that's a rock, a concretion. We had one guy come in one year and said, I brought you a dinosaur egg. And Russell, my colleague said, JP, you have to come out here. This guy really has an egg. And it was one of these uh, bird eggs from the White River Formation. Uh, he kept it for himself because it was really cool. So they are, they are the most common, probably the most common uh, bird fossils found in the state. That doesn't mean there's a lot of them. Our colleague, my colleague, Ken Sundell, who collects in the White River Badlands east of Douglas, has been doing it for 30 years and has found seven of them. So not common. In the Miocene, there's not much Miocene fossils in Wyoming. This is one I found north of Cheyenne. It's now in the Tate Collections. And let's see, my trick here. Uh, I put that in the last minute, there it is. This is a close up of the foot here. And you can't see it very well because my camera is not that great. But the three little pulleys there are almost in a straight line, which tells us that this is a songbird. And I haven't said much about songbirds because back in the Eocene, there was not really much, not such thing as a songbird. We're now in the Miocene, and the only Miocene bird fossil, one of the few Miocene bird fossils from Wyoming is probably a songbird. We had this thing on loan to a fellow in Alabama, 
Georgia, Georgia. And he got as far as be able to tell me it's probably a thrush. So just like your modern Robin. And then he got an administrative job and then he retired. And that's all we know. <laughs> and I'm pretty much done here. I'm not gonna talk about the Pliocene because there are none and the Pleistocene is too similar. Here's a couple of your takeaway messages. Most bird fossils are known from very few specimens. Wyoming's oldest fossil is one isolated verte vertebra. The Cretaceous and Paleocene record, well, the Cretaceous record is very fragmentary. The Paleocene is based on that one Willwood Formation limestone nodule site outside of Cody. The Eocene record in Wyoming is amongst the best in the world. Let's just forget about Germany. Uh, this is the, this is, I think, the take home message here. So many of these Eocene birds are tropical and things that you find even on the other side of the world at this point in time. There's some really interesting paleogeography and evolution going on there. And that's for a whole different talk by someone who specializes in this stuff. Um, after the Eocene, pretty spotty record. There's a lot more work to be done. I'm actually on the board of the uh, state fossil board on the, uh, which is run out of the survey in Laramie, the geological survey. And they are trying to figure out what to do with their fossil collection. And one of the things they told me is that they have 23 fossil bird specimens laying around waiting to be prepared and described. So there's a bunch out there. The, uh, the Field Museum in Chicago just bought one of the commercial quarry guys in Kemmerer's collection. Mm -hmm. And they, there is now a great display in the Field Museum if you get to Chicago of fossil birds. But they are still to be described, most of them. And let's see, uh, <coughs> hey, stop, it's, it's speaking. Identification on partial bones is a lot of what this record is, but I don't think it's terribly reliable. And I'm hoping we find more of these Eocene nodules all over the state. I don't see it happening, I don't much hope, but it is cool to dream. Uh, thank you to all these people for photos and for help. And I'm just gonna thumb through a whole pile more undescribed birds that I know are out there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there are a lot of plausible ideas about why mammals survive the uh, Cretaceous tertiary boundary, but what, how did birds survive in a very different environment? I wish you hadn't asked that. <laughs> <laughs> well, for one thing, I only mentioned them once. The enantiornithines did not survive. And there's, there's great big arguments. And I showed that one picture from the Lance Formation, which is there was a beak of a parrot and the coracoid of something and a, a couple of shorebirds. That study is about 30 years old. And people argue that those really aren't what they are because those lineages based on... Uh, DNA, DNA studies, some of those lineages should not go back that far. But there's other studies that say those other bird lineages do go back before the, before the dinosaur extinction. We just haven't found the fossils yet. So did they really survive? Did they, I mean, they, they might have evolved before the Cretaceous extinction and, and then flowered afterwards, let's say, like the mammals did. And why did they survive? I think it's much easier to say why the other things went extinct. <laughs> the, the, big, the big argument now is that the things that survived were able to hide in water or burrows. So a lot of the mammals were in burrows, crocodiles, turtles, frogs, they all survived, but they were probably in ponds. But in the, in the ocean, ammonites, mosasaurs, those toothed birds, plesiosaurs, they all went extinct. They were in the water. You tell me, <laughs> I don't know. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Is Wyoming unique in its paucity of fossil birds, or are Wyoming states pretty scantily? He's asking if Wyoming is unique in the paucity of fossil birds. Wyoming is unique in the richness of the bird record in the Green River Formation, except for Germany. But any other place where they where they collect basically scraps of bones and looking for mammal teeth, they will find occasional bird fossils. And that happens a lot in a lot of the states here, including all the way up into Canada and Mexico. 
And there's even places in uh, Maryland or Virginia where they have Eocene birds, but again, isolated bones. And again, it's a place where people collect fossils publicly, thousands of fossils have been collected there, six bird fossils. So yeah, bird fossils are pretty rare. So we're kind of lucky to have A, a lot of people looking for mammal fossils and B, the Green River Formation. With commercial fish quarries, you spend a lot of time digging up stuff, you'll find the rare things. With that quarry so rich in metal, do you think that was due to some outgassing? I don't know enough about it. The one book I have is in German. <laughs> My German is, I get a headache just trying to read the picture captions. <laughs> Never mind a real sentence. <laughs> it's, uh, it's rich in oil shale. So there's something very organic going on. And it wasn't until the, I think the 70s where local collectors started figuring out, because you'd, you'd peel, these, peel these layers open. Here's my layers of rock. And you'd find a fossil. And before you were able to put it in your backpack, the thing would dry out and crumble. So they found that if you peel the fossil open, wrap it in wet newspaper, put it in a Ziploc, get it home, let it dry very, very slowly by opening that Ziploc. And then when it's somewhat stable, you embed it in an epoxy and then you start prepping it from the other side. So a lot of mesal fossils are just the bones in a layer of epoxy. And then to make it look real, they paint the epoxy brown. <laughs> and that, that was, took a lot of, a lot of private collectors worked on that for probably 10 years to perfect it. Yes, um, I remember many years ago going to the Ulrichs fossil quarry in the Green River Formation. And um, I remember them saying that anything unusual they had to give to the state yeah where are those what, what does that mean so to she, the state? if you couldn't hear it she said years ago she went to the ulrich's fossil quarry in kemmerer area and they said that anything unusual had to go back to the state ulrich's quarry they're one of the 20 and they uh are they have a long history of work in that area but it's on state land and the state allows them to collect for uh, commercial market, but anything except for six common species has to go back to the state. And these went to the, they go to the geological survey. And several years ago, the story gets more interesting. Wally Ulrich uh, became the, uh, the state geologist. So he was in charge of the collections that had been donated back to the state from his quarry. And he got busted with a truckload of fossils going to God knows where. <laughs> and he's no longer a geologist. <laughs> and actually, I mean, you guys, when that happened, the survey called us and they called you guys here and they said, we have a truckload of fossils. Do you guys want them? And I, I know you guys went down and I went down, collected a bunch of cool stuff. And at the end, uh, I, everything we collected was, was fishes and maybe a crocodile. At the end, they said, okay, Tate Museum, take these, get them out of our warehouse. And we started slowly going through them. And there was actually a, a nice a slab this big with a big bird wing in it. So that was kind of cool. But right now they all go back to the state survey. And that's where those 23 specimens that bird specimens are that I mentioned right at the end that they are trying to figure out what to do. Is that found in Cheyenne or Atlanta? It's in... Uh, or not neither. It's in the survey is in oh, is in Laramie, but we went to Cheyenne because the they have the fossils were in a warehouse in Cheyenne. Hmm. Any bird watchers in the group? <laughs> Where can I go bird watching? Oh, it's, no, I'm not gonna find anything. Go <laughs> owling. <laughs> yeah, I go owling. <laughs> All right. Any last questions, comments, complaints? Yes. I was just like to know why. What is the explanation for why they're so bird fossils are so rare? Why what? Why are bird fossils so rare? Why they're why, why why? They so rare? Why? Why, why? That's an excellent question. Because birds, bird bones are very delicate. They have to be very thin to allow them to fly, and that's the main reason given. Because I mean, you look around here, birds are extremely common. There are more birds out there than there probably are mammals, not counting rodents, small rodents but it's because they are very delicate. And same, same thing with pterosaurs. Pterosaurs, the other flying reptiles, the fossils are incredibly delicate. We've been working a lance formation quarry north of Lusk, 
We've collected probably 2,000 bones. One of those is a pterosaur bone, and they're just delicate. And that's, I mean, some places like the, that Presbyornis nesting site, which is just chock full of bones, what's going on there that they do get preserved? Who knows? How many quarries are there in wild areas? Are like hundreds of sites where people are actually How many quarries are there in Wyoming? Fossil quarries in general? Yeah. Oh, God. Lots. Lots. <laughs> Lots. I mean, the whole Bighorn Basin on the other side of the mountains here, every, every summer gets inundated by paleontologists from all over the world. Well, yeah, all over the world. And I mean, we've been work. We have a couple of quarries down by Medicine Bow. We're working in the past three years. There's a bunch of Europeans coming to dig in Medicine Bow, and they all have their quarries now too. There are quarries all over the place, run by museums, private individuals, and commercial outfits. Okay, this is off birds, but okay, I think one of the coolest stories I know about Wyoming geological things is the story of the. Um, Dinosaur bone cabin down. Can, can you talk about that in the whole awesome. radioactivity? The dinosaur bone cabin. She, <laughs> wants, this is, she said it's an off bird story. That's why I decided to leave. <laughs> but it's, uh, she asked about the dinosaur, the dinosaur bone cabin outside of Medicine Bow. Any of you guys familiar with this on the way to Laramie? It was, uh, it says it's the oldest building in the world, but the buildings at the University of Wyoming are made of, I think, Casper limestone, which is three times as old as the Morrison formation, and lots of rocks are much older than the Morrison the buildings, but it was built in the 30s when that highway was still the main highway before I-80, and it was built as a tourist trap based uh, from bones they found just over the hill, because just over the hill is Como Bluff, dinosaur fossil area. And they just picked up a bunch of stuff on the surface and made a house out of it. And it was a, when I first moved to Laramie in 1990, it was still an operating museum. But they're all radioactive, every right. one of those. Yes. Yeah. Highly radioactive. I don't know about highly. Oh, okay. we've, we've tested the stuff that we collect from Medicine Bow and from Alcova, and they are just a little bit above background. And that's tested by a guy who was the radiation specialist at the uranium mines in Shirley Basin. So I trust him. But there's varying levels of radiation in the Morrison bones. Utah bones tend to be very radioactive. Wyoming bones, less so. But I think it varies locally as well. Um, but the, yeah, it was, it was built in the 30s. It was a tourist attraction. When I first moved to Laramie, it was still open. You could pay two bucks as a student and go in. And it was full of fossils and shells, many of them badly identified. <laughs> it was kind of funny. <laughs> And then they, it was uh, it went abandoned in the past 10 years. The place has been broken into, the windows are all smashed, all the displays are cattywumpused in there. There's nothing left worth anything. And a few years ago, the town of Medicine Bow, some people decided they want to save the building, move it into town as a museum, put it on the museum grounds in Medicine Bow. And they paid someone 45,000 bucks to start moving it. And if you drive by it now, it's sitting on half a dozen big red I-beams ready to move. The guy took his 45,000 bucks, did $30,000 worth, and left. Because he found that the building had no foundation. And as soon as he started moving it, it started cracking. And it was over his head, is the story I hear. And it's still sitting there. Last I heard, they want to move it into town this summer. But I heard that last summer and the summer before. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> I hope that I hope that they manage to save it. All right, thank JP for coming up to